to this Authors in Conversation panel featuring the 2022 Minnesota Book Awards finalists in contention for the Emily Buchwald Award for Minnesota Nonfiction. The Minnesota Book Awards is a program of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library in the organization's capacity as the Minnesota Center for the Book. This year's Book Awards are sponsored by Education Minnesota. The Emily Buchwald Award for Minnesota Nonfiction is sponsored through the generosity of Bookmobile Craft Digital. My name is Sue Leaf. I write on nature and environmental issues from my home in Chisago County. My books, The Bullhead Queen and A Love Affair with Birds were finalists for a Minnesota Book Award in 2010 and 2014 respectively. Last year, my book, Minnesota's Geologist, The Life of Newton Horace Winchell, received the Emily Buchwald Award, a great honor. As we get started, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land on which most of us on this panel recording are zooming in from today. This land was reserved for the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851 and it remains sacred to them today. We acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. The Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of story in this place now called Minnesota. The Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, organizers of the Minnesota Book Awards, honor this tradition and knowledge and values embedded in it as we all work, up to work together to lift up storytellers in our state. For this latest installment of the Minnesota Book Awards popular Meet the Finalist series, I'm pleased to be joined by Richard Bresnahan, author of Kura, Prophetic Messenger, published by Kura Book Publishing, LLC. Hampton Smith, author of Confluence, A History of Fort Snelling, published by Minnesota Historical Society Press. Danny Spivak, author of From the Gridiron to the Battlefield, Minnesota's March to a College Football Title and Into World War II, published by Roman and Littlefield. And Amy C. Sullivan, author of Opioid Reckoning, Love, Loss, and Redemption in the Rehab State, published by the University of Minnesota Press. Congratulations to each of you. I've been in your shoes and I know how exciting it is. In the interest of making the most of our short time together, I'm going to begin with a round robin question that I'd like each of you to respond to in turn. Then I'll have another round robin question. And then later I will want to ask questions of each of you about your book. So the first round robin question to break the ice is, why did you write this book and why did you write it now? Who wants to go first? Richard, you wanna go first? Thank you. And thank you for the uh, honor of being able to speak um, on this uh, wonderful day. The uh, reason for writing the book was in uh, 2017, uh, they, uh, the university uh, dedicated uh, the, the building of an outdoor sculpture garden that uh, is named after John Hasler, the great author, Minnesota writer and novelist and playwright. And in that garden, there was uh, by design by the architect were areas for sculptural installation and in that an exterior environment. And I was commissioned by the president um, of the university to create a, the first sculpture for the John Hasler Sculpture Garden. And that was um, commissioned in 2017. And that was the beginning of the process. And so the uh, book, chronicles and develops um, the evolution of that particular sculpture and what is in the interior of this sculpture. So that's how um, over the last four year period, uh, the a book and the sculpture have been um, brought together. Um, so that's why you wrote it now too, right? Yeah, because one of the uh, interesting things was that it was that to approach the design committee at uh, a university is often an interesting experience. And the architects and the designers and the landscape architects and the monastic community that were present at the time 
uh, queried, you know, they were uh, taken aback by the nature of the sculpture because it's a, a 21st environmental sculpture, not necessarily something that is reminiscent of 20th century sculpture. So the aspect of using recycled materials, uh, non-extraction, and then recognizing the sacred as part of the process, um, the question was brought up as if, how will people know what's inside the sculpture? And I said, there will be a book that will be accompanying um, that will evolve and develop and explain what is inside the Quran prophetic messenger sculpture. So they really kind of went hand in hand uh, with the completion of the sculpture and then the um, selection of the artists that were going to be considered helping with that uh, uh, process. Okay, Hampton. Okay, um, I actually was sort of the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the building of Fort Snelling. The society, the Minnesota Historical Society wanted to do a more comprehensive history of the fort. Um, and Pam McClanahan, who was the head of the MHS Press, this was, I think about 2018, no, 2017. Um, I just retired and she said, well, you're not doing anything. <laughs> so would you like to write a history of Fort Snelling? And after taking a deep breath and thinking about it for a while, I just, I agreed to do it. Um, I realized at the time that it was somewhat controversial. Uh, there's, you know, lots of ways of seeing the history of the fort. Um, and it was, it's a big complex story. So, and it's been an adventure. I really enjoy doing it. So and that so that also explains why you wrote it now. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the 200th anniversary of the fort. Yeah, and and of course, you know, it, it's been delayed by various things by the author and by uh, you know uh, getting uh, actually getting it printed during the uh, yeah. the, the shutdown and stuff was really hard. It was amazing, very frustrating. Okay, thank you, Danny. Well, well, nice to be with you all this morning. Um, I, um, I have a personal connection to my book as my grandfather was a member of the 1941 freshman team at the University of Minnesota. And um, that kind of, you know, always had had caught my interest. Um, but why now was really, well, well one, the, the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, of course, was December 2021. Um, and, and also having moved to Minnesota just in 2018, you know, I always had grown up, you know, knowing of my my grandfather having played football at the U of M and, and having attended school there, and of course having gone into the Army Air Corps. And uh, when I moved here, you know, being interested in in family history and and sort of you know going to his old homes and his old North Side neighborhood and looking at where my grandmother had grown up here, um, you know, that I started to get really interested in in just that. Um, what that team accomplished in 1941 um, and the time period and, and time frame in which they did it, just finishing their season just a couple of weeks before Pearl Harbor. Um, so so it's, what started is kind of a, um, a project that I wasn't sure what direction it was going to go into, um, kind of took on a life of its own. And and that was really the why and, and the when. And, and especially with the 80th anniversary, I think it gave an interesting lens into, into looking into to that time period on such an important yeah. date. Yeah. Thank you. And Amy, why did you write your book and why did you write it now? Thanks for inviting me and for having this opportunity. It's lovely to meet the, the rest of you here. Um, my book is also extremely personal. I was um, uh, the mother of a child who experienced um, an opioid overdose and survived. Um, and I'm also a historian. And so my worlds collided. And as I was learning more about um, how this could have even been possible, which I didn't even understand how this could be possible, I learned um, the history of, of drug, um, of how the opioid epidemic emerged. And then I learned that Minnesota is the founding state for what we consider drug treatment in the United States, uh, the abstinence only model, the 12 step model. And I could see this was clearly not working. 
Um, so I started by interviewing people um, just for a project, uh, which I call the Minnesota Opioid Project. Um, I'm an oral historian, so I collect stories, um, as particularly when things have changed or about to change. And this seemed like a really, really important story uh, to get. Um, while I was writing the book, or just as it was coming out, um, it was announced that 100,000 people died last year in this country from an opioid epidemic, 100,000. And, you know, it, it just, um, there was a point while I was writing it where I thought that maybe we were getting a handle on it because the death numbers were kind of going down. And then when the pandemic hit, it just, they just came rising right up again. So that's why I wrote it now. And I was kind of hoping when I started it five or six years ago that it would kind of be over. <laughs> Um, but it's been going on so long. We have we we now the CDC has describes it as in waves. So why you know why do we let this go? So I wrote it because I I think there's just incredible ignorance around um, substance use disorders, and I think there's incredible stigma, and there's also a real gulf of empathy. And I discovered that while I was interviewing people, that other I was like this these people their stories have to be told because you can't listen to this story and still have the same stigma against people who suffer or you people and people who use drugs, you just can't. So that's kind of my, that's my reason for now. I want this epidemic to end. Nice, thank you. Well, as I'm listening to you talking, I gave you a second round robin question and I don't know if you maybe take this opportunity to, to go into your book a little in a little more depth but um, Richard, do you want to give this a shot? A new writing of history often means telling an old story in a new way. Did you do this year? At your book, is that even a relevant question to ask you? I think for the other ones, maybe it is. Yeah, it, it, this is a very relevant question because okay. um, one, of, one of the parts, the main part of this book, um, and I'm going to be grabbing it here, um, was that in the, um, in the, uh, ideas and thoughts about the creating of the book was um, where these ancient materials came from. So even in the particular sculpture project, um, if you have the book handy on page 30, uh, I believe page 31, um, I believe there's, um, and I apologize for the rest of the um, uh, individuals that are with us today that um, the, um, Oh, you're talking about the granite steps? Yes, the granite from the, steps. From the abbey. From the abbey. Yeah. And so um, when, what, those, when the, um, I went to high school at St. John's and I went to college at St. John's before going to Japan uh, to study with a National Living Treasure pottery family. They've been making pottery for 13 generations. And uh, on my return, the uh, elevation to those steps because of the, uh, handicap accessibility, the steps were taken out and put in the Abbey Boneyard or storage area out in the um, uh, more removed from the university campus site. And the stones were absolutely beautiful. So uh, I would keep telling the physical plant people, don't throw those stones away. They're absolutely important um, to the history of the St. John's. And then when you find out about the stones on page 30, uh, 32, you'll see a photograph of that uh, James J. Hill steam engine running across um, an open prairie, which, was east, which now is East St. Cloud. And there's this snow filled kind of like March time period we're in right now, where that the quarry is the only quarry of all of Minnesota and this region that has black granite. And for years, it went down to the cities to, um, to build, uh, since 1893, stones would be quarried uh, and sent down to the Minneapolis St. Paul to build foundations for structures. But then in 1895, the state of Minnesota bought that quarry from its owner to build the St. Cloud prison. Mm -hmm. And you can see the wooden walls there from the historical society and the quarry in the center. So all the prisoners had to 
quarry that to build their own wall to wall themselves in. That's when the monastery ordered the steps. So in 1896, um, the steps were then ordered and then created in a very difficult handmade process to cut out stones that large by hand. And those prisoners were never paid. Yeah. So over a hundred years, people have walked on those steps wearing down the old shot line wire saw cutting to where that where the stones lapped, you see the history of the cutting of the stones and the back of the stones, which are now very visible because they stand upright, holding the kura in suspension, that the you actually see the efforts of those prisoners quarrying those stones. So in every aspect of the book, there was this relationship to the ecological systems of extraction in America, how we've gone about that. But also one of the most important parts of this sculpture was somehow the healing process between two great nations of people who came to these places. You mentioned in your opening, the Ojibwe people. And I went to high school uh, with students, classmates of mine from Red Lake. And Winona LeDuc is a dear friend. And when we would talk about, she would bring the wild rice hulls from the parching to the St. John's pottery that we use in our firing systems. So there is a beautiful map at the women's monastic community at St. Ben's in St. Joseph, Minnesota of a sacred map of the wild rice harvest lakes, which begin in central Minnesota and go north. And every different tribe would have the responsibility of different lakes. So even the Menominee Indians from Eastern Wisconsin would come all the way to harvest wild rice in central Minnesota. And that is as sacred as what the Christian community would consider the communion or the wine and the bread. Wild rice was that sacred to that community. And there were ceremonies where that different tribes would go to different lakes of different communities and reseed in a seeding to mother earth into the lake, which expanded the genetics of the unique genetics of those particular lakes of wild rice. So, the whole aspect of this sculpture inside the Kura is a combining or joining or togetherness of 182 endangered seed species of the three sisters, beans, squash, pumpkin, and corn. Many of them coming from indigenous royalties, um, from fed and different seed companies, heirloom seed companies. And they are then protected and put inside the Kura for long periods of use. So the design of the prophetic messenger is the protection of those indigenous systems and natural materials of this region. Then with that is a scroll of the rule of St. Benedict based on women. So the women's monastic community, I commissioned Mary Bruno to do the first ever scroll on handmade Japanese paper of the rule of St. Benedict and the women who cared and believed in that rule. Two separate communities believing both that this land is sacred and now they are together. Thank you. In this, uh, thank you. Yeah, very cool idea. Um, Hampton, do you want to answer this question? Um, the retelling of an old story in a new way? Yeah, I, I, when I started the book, I, I, there had been a lot written about Fort Snelling, um, most of it dealing with the first 40, 50 years of the fort's existence. And I didn't want to just retell the, the same military story over and over again, um, which is, you know, it's been told before. I wanted to expand it into 
the 21st century, but I also wanted to tell that early story from a different point of view. I wanted to include uh, the impact on the Dakota people, how they viewed the fort, um, what their expectations of the fort were. Um, I also wanted to, to give that in, the idea that the impression that the fort was located in a wilderness was a mistaken one that in fact, this was the Dakota homeland it had been for centuries. And that what to whites and Europeans looked like a wilderness was somebody's home. And that it was not an empty land that had never been used. It was a land that had been lived in and used for a long time. So I wanted to be sure to bring that out. Um, but I also wanted to tell other stories of the fort, uh, African-Americans also of the of the, um, the forts varying roles over time, because it went from being a frontier outpost to being a supply depot, to being a place where troops were trained, uh, to being a hospital. And then uh, later on in the final chapters, I talk about um, how the, the fort's interpretation, how the history of the fort was interpreted um, is very important because it, it reflects on how we view our own history and how that history is interpreted over time. You know, do you want to talk on a little bit lighter note, do you want to talk about the marches, the long marches that some of the soldiers made just for- um, Oh, well, there, the, probably, the one that impressed me the most was uh, in the, the early, I think it was in 1920, the third infantry regiment, which is the old guard, they want to sort of rack regiments of the US army. This is, after World War II, you know, they were, they were stationed in Ohio and they were going to be stationed in Fort Snelling. And this was the second time they'd be stationed at Fort Snelling. So it's kind of a publicity stunt. The army had them march from Southern Ohio all the way to St. Paul. <laughs> they could, from what it cost them to supply these guys as they marched this you know, hundreds of miles, they could have given them all a train ticket and saved them all a lot of shoe leather, but um, it looked very good. You know, there was news coverage all along the way and uh, they remembered this march for years and their reunions, they, the soldiers would talk about the, you know, I was on the march to St. Paul because it happened between uh, late October and early December. So the weather was going through Southern Wisconsin was terrible, um, but that's just one. And they would also go out on maneuvers uh, this again, uh, that was probably in the 1880s and 90s, they started doing this at the troop station. They would make marches through the countryside. Uh, they did one that was up around, they did a, cir a circuit of, uh, of uh, Lake Minnetonka and came back. And, but these were always get a lot of newspaper publicity and it you know, made the army look good. Sure, they were doing something over there. Yeah. I thought that was, that's something I'd never heard before. <laughs> no one had ever referenced that in any newspaper I'd ever read. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, as we were talking before this, we got into this, it, it was, uh, the newspapers were an incredible source for history on Fort Snelling. I was always amazed by it. Yeah, cool. Danny, um, I know you linked in your book, you, to link the Golden Gophers to what they actually did in the war. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. And kind of like Hampton was talking about Fort Snelling, um, I, I thought of that as well when I was thinking about Pearl Harbor and World War II, because of course, many people have written uh, about the, those topics and um, and people have written about Minnesota's role in, in, in those world events. Um, but I tried to sort of just take a really specific look at this this group of young people that were were playing the sport on this national stage and and the prominence that they had in the community across the state and across the nation and the time period in which they were competing and then of course what they went on to do in the war and the the months and years to follow after their season um, but what i was really struck by what i really tried to do was transport myself back into that time and really take a step-by-step -step look at what it would have been like to be 18 to 21 years old and in, in college at the U of M, um, just in those, those lead-ups to, to, to 1941. Um, with the war raging overseas and and the uncertainty at home, I, I think was um, was what I really tried to to, to highlight. 
And, and of course, we know about that and thinking about that and all that we've learned since. Um, but but really to think about the autumn of 1941 and the world events that were shaping um, those, you know, September, October, November into early December. And I think a lot of times maybe we we forget about that time period because you know when 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 we're, even when we're we're growing up in school we're you know the history of World War II in America often starts on December seventh but but of course there were, were a lot of things that were shaping you know the uh, the build up to that to that uh, surprise attack and so um, my book really just sort of takes you through you know who these young men were where they came from a lot of them from Minnesota but not all. Some of them had very compelling stories. Um, there was uh, one whose future wife had just escaped Nazi Germany and had come to America via Holland. Uh, there was uh, Bruce Smith, who was really nationally famous um, heading into the 1941 season, was a native of Faribault and was really um, um, a point of pride for that town. And there were a lot of those stories, just a lot of um, players from a variety of different backgrounds. And, and of course, you know, the, the book takes you through uh, the lead up to the season. And then of course, uh, you know, each of the eight games that are played and, and Minnesota playing in front of thousands of fans and, and on CBS and NBC national radio, national newspaper headlines. And then of course, when December 7th hits, they all scatter into different directions. And, and uh, some of them remain stateside and were working on Navy bases and, and others, you know, were at uh, Iwo Jima or, or Normandy um, in, in at least one case. And so, uh, it was really just the juxtaposition of trying to put yourself in the shoes of of young people from 18 to 21 years old, and then just the responsibility that came with um, with all that followed. I think I was surprised to see that the first person from the team to leave was Bernie Bierman himself. Sure, yes, the the head coach Bernie Bierman. Um, who was a very well-known figure had been on the the front of the Wheaties box, you know, in the 1930s. And of course the Gophers were, were sort of the premier program of college football during the depression and, and in the years before world war two. And, and yes, he, um, he had served in world war one, had been in Cuba during world war one in the Marines and he was called right back and they gave him an interesting position during world war two, where he was the head of a physical education program and was coaching a football team that was training and, you know, doing a pre-flight uh, training, exercises and, and, and down in Iowa. And of course there was a lot of criticism as to why are you playing a sport, you know, in the middle of a war and, and there were differing opinions on that, but, but the, the, the armed forces in many cases felt that it was uh, something they could incorporate into training. And they thought that Bernie Bierman was somebody that could, um, could help with some of the physical fitness aspects. Not unlike marching from Ohio to Port Snelling. Anyway. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Amy, um, do you want to talk about um, new writing of history? And maybe you can even talk about um, the Minnesota model. I want to tell you that I live in Center City. Oh, I live, okay. I live two miles from Hazelden. Yeah. And I know um, personally at least one architect of the Minnesota model. So I'm just oh. anxious to hear you talk about your book. Talk about yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I didn't, I had no, all I thought when, when my family first encountered this and all the other parents I encountered, um, was just send your send your loved one to treatment and um, then it'll be things will be fine. Um, and what I discovered um, was that treatment <laughs> was this thing that everyone did, but no one seemed to really understand what it was or what was happening there. And then it was to my great surprise that it that Minnesota was the you know the birthplace of what we call drug treatment. Um, there's one other that kind of is a split off, and then. Um, but in terms of like an abstinence program that's very inward facing and very morality based and met and, and thinks about the individual and their moral character, um, that program, that model was set up for priests and lawyers and doctors who had alcoholism. And in the 1930s, 40s, and then Hazelden opened in the late 40s. And that, when I learned that as a historian, I was just kind of like, wow, no wonder this isn't working. Um, because this is a very different group of people who you know, needed anonymity and wanted it, who had professional careers and had things they didn't want other people to know about. So the anonymity aspect of it and the privacy of the, of the private organization played into it. Meanwhile, you have epidemics happening. You have a heroin epidemic in the 1960s. And this is where a new model comes up from a, um, two doctors. Uh, I like to credit the woman in this because I think she did 
more of the work, Marie Niswender. Um, she worked uh, first at the Lexington Narc Narcotic Farm, which many people also don't know that history. Um, and that she left because they were trying out drugs on the people who had come there to be treated for a heroin addiction. But the model um, was interesting in that it was still this idea of keeping people in one place who had the same problem. She goes off to New York and discovers that the pain, the drug used for pain, methadone, which is an opioid derivative, in low doses was able to stabilize her patients who had been addicted to heroin. And then she figures out a whole treatment model. Unfortunately, methadone at this time was put into um, inner city places where more people of color were suffering from a heroin use disorder. So it, the whole drug treatment system became stigmatized because of the time that it was, that it emerged and where it emerged. So you have these two, then you have HIV AIDS that happens in the eighties. And I know you're like, what does this have to do with anything? Well, injection drug users were one of those people who, one of those groups that were spreading HIV. So the concept of harm reduction comes about in this time to try to prevent that epidemic from spreading like wildfire. And so when we say harm reduction, we think of condoms and then there's also um, bloodborne um, injection. So people who would share needles. So this model develops completely on its own and is seen as a total outlier. What I was trying to do was to integrate, to show how through the experiences of my narrators, to let people feel what their whole life story was about and what led them to that moment, what led them to their own recovery, what led them to wanna to work in the treatment system to help other people and really think about how Minnesota could actually, we could be a leader if we would open our eyes and be willing to accept three models. And over the course of my, the time working on this, I did notice some changes. So Hazelden, for instance, is now using medication and that's because one of my, the most, one of the most delightful interviewees I had was Marv Seppala, the chief medical director. Oh, yeah. And his story is in the center of the book and it is just one of my favorite interviews that I ever um, had. We talked, we, I have like four hours of interview time with him. We had to meet twice. Um, but his life really meshes these two things. And so in him, I found a, a, a narrator that people would trust and listen to, and he could see both sides. And I think that that's the part that is missing. So when we just vilify you know, the drug war, or we just vilify people who use drugs, or we just vilify the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma, <laughs> or we just vilify 12, 12 steps, we're not getting anywhere. And so I wanted my book to integrate these ideas through the voices of, of my narrators who said things just so, so powerfully and poignantly. Um, and I think that, you know, in writing history in a new way, I definitely did that because not very many historians include their own story <laughs> in their book, especially not PhD historians who like my Myself. So I took a big chance in writing it this way, um, but my, my editor was really helpful in saying, Amy, we need you in this journey. We need you in this story because these are really hard stories to read about. And you, we trust you, you're, you're, I'm trusting you as I'm reading. And so I need you to stay in these chapters because there was a point where I wasn't, I was like, no, this is just, this is, I can just start here and then I can go on. And he's like, no, 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 this is too hard. So it is a hard history, um, but it, it is also a hopeful one. Amy, it's called creative nonfiction. I, I think I know. you're an editor and I can just hear him. <laughs> yes. <that. laughs> yes. yes, but when you have to go through the peer review process, you don't feel very creative after that experience. So I was, yeah. Okay, I think we're ready to turn to individual questions. And I see I've got Hampton up first. Um, I was intrigued by the map at the beginning of your book that showed Dakota villages with a contemporary map superimposed upon them. Would you want to talk about how you brought that map into being? I'm assuming that it's a creative, it was a creative 
move on your part. And how did you decide what to include on the map and what were your sources? Well, I, I really was inspired to do the map by uh, uh, the book, Minnesota Makoche. I don't know whether you've seen that. Uh, Bruce White and, um, what's it? I can't remember. Um, we got it over here. So. But anyway, um, that book, which talks about the Dakota homeland and how this, you know, where the whole area of the Minnesota River Valley, the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers was the center of the heartland of the Dakota, of the Dakota world, really, uh, at that time. And I thought it would be uh, informative to show um, the, where the Dakota villages were and the important uh, places, uh, the sacred places of the Dakota and how their relationship, not only to Fort Snelling, but also to contemporary locations around here. Um, it was, um, I, the, the map itself, I did not create. I mean, it's, you know, they had a map designer create the map. But I, I really wanted to have something like that in the book because I mentioned the villages a lot in, in the, particularly in the first section of the book. They show up in Lawrence Tolliver's journals all over the place. He talks about Black Dog Village and uh, Little Crow's Village and so on. And so it was, uh, I thought it was important and instructive for people to know what I was talking about. And uh, so that's kind of the reason why it's, it's there. Yeah, it's really, um, it was unsettling for me to see how much we have obliterated in a mirror of 170 oh, years. Yeah, it's, um, I, I heard stories of when um, Highway, it was Highway 110, I don't, it's changed 68, I think it's now called, uh, when they, they made the cut um, past Pilot Knob. Oh, yeah. And the road cut that they and the, the bulldozers actually exposed burials. And uh, rather than tell any archaeologist or tell anybody that from the state that this had happened, they just dumped the bone somewhere. Um, and uh, that I don't know, you know, the truth of this, but it's a, you know, was a rumor. But they, you know, so, you know, if you go, you can go to Pilot Knob now, you can go, you know, up to the top, but you can see that it's, you know, been all cut up and, you know, they tried to restore it, but you can tell it's, it's, it's not the same, but um, yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. It was one place that I kept trying to find out where it was and I've never been able to, there were actually there are two locations. I'd really I'd love to know the exact location of. One of them is a place called Land's End, which was just, it was like a trading post. It was on the Minnesota River, uh, sort of near where the Mall of America is now. Um, and um, so there's that location. The other one was a place called Rumtown, which is now in Highland Park. <laughs> but uh, Rumtown was across the Mississippi River from Fort Snelling. And so when, uh, after the Treaty of 1837, when white settlers could go into that area between the Minnesota and the Mississippi and the St. Croix, the, the uh, Fur traders immediately went into the rum business and started selling rum, particularly to the soldiers at Fort Snelling. So rum town was a going concern. It was one of the reasons that the, the army decided to throw everybody out of the military reservation and extend the reservation across the river. And all those people were forced off the military reservation and went down to Pig's Eyes Place and found it in St. Paul. So it's an interesting story. Yeah, right. Danny. For your book, I'll have to say, I think I went to more football games reading your book than I had in the last 10 years. Um, so what were your sources for your vivid accounts of the games? I was, I was in there on the play-by-play -play and I wondered how you transferred um, what you were either watching or hearing to the written page. You know, that's a really good question because that was really difficult. Um, there's not a lot of film that survived from that era. Very little. There are some snippets of things. And, and there was actually a, a Hollywood movie made of, of Bruce Smith, the Heisman Trophy winner. And that had some of the major plays of the season. So I was able to witness that with my own eyes. But 
Otherwise, it was looking at as many newspaper accounts as possible. So all the daily newspapers in Minnesota, but then also the daily newspapers from the teams that Minnesota was playing against. So if it was Michigan, you know, looking at, um, you know, the Detroit Free Press um, or any of the Ann Arbor papers and a lot of the student newspapers, because in those days they had they all had journalists covering the games and that was a major part was piecing together and taking different perspectives of each newspaper, you know, reading six to seven different accounts and trying to figure out which one was most accurate. Um, all of them had very vivid play by plays because there was no highlight packages to watch. There was no, you know, other than just watching the newsreels and the movie theaters. Um, but then also found some really interesting notes. Uh, there was a, a reporter for one of the Minneapolis papers. I can't remember if it was the Tribune or the Star Journal at the time, but in the uh, Gale Family Library at the, uh, at the History Center, there's actually uh, his handwritten notes of one of the games and, and his little blue notepad. And, and I thought that was really fascinating because it was a way to follow the game kind of, um, kind of alongside somebody who actually witnessed it. And, and so, so that was how I, I put together the game accounts. And there was some audio of radio accounts that, that still survive. So that helped. Um, but I, I appreciate you saying that because I, when I, um, when I was writing the book, I had hoped to really try to capture the human element of it and, and um, write it to a general audience that uh, even if it, um, you know, whether it was the football aspect or the military history or the social history, I wanted everyone to be able to kind of, you know, transport back into that period. And, and so it was very fun to, you know, put myself into those, those fall Saturdays and, and uh, um, all the people watching and listening across the country. And I was singing the rouser. <laughs> I know Wisconsin's and I know Michigan's and I know Minnesota's. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was vivid. Um, Richard, I was impressed by the multitude of ways that you develop your artistic ideas um, with your hands and several different ways with your hands in conversation with your collaborators and friends and by mining your memories, for example, of the friend that had the horse that was shot, that was very vivid for me. Yeah. So in putting um, pen to paper and, and making a written word, did that give you a different way to explore some of your ideas? Mm -hmm. um, by those types of journaling have been going, uh, in when I was in Japan, I had the uh, great fortune of um, my art history teacher, Sister Johanna Becker, who was this great Asian art historian of America. She taught John Pope and of the Freer Gallery and Rosenthal of Harvard. And uh, Johanna reminded that uh, journaling was one of the most important things as a art historian. So when I came back from Japan, I had a thousand pages of journals. And I kept doing that journaling throughout that course of time. And so those stories that uh, from Alan Wagner, the Arabian horse uh, raiser, uh, rancher, to um, the stories from my uh, childhood uh, were, were have been written down. And they were very important and kept. So that was uh, to have the time, though, to actually do writing was, I think, the gift of the pandemic. Uh, I, I think especially since it, we were going to try and connect artists as seeds and seeds as artists. And to write those biographies of the seeds and to read as much and then uh, having uh, my wife Colette do the 182 professional biographies of the seeds was an incredible amount of research um, outside of what you can normally find. So that aspect, and then when April 7th um, in 2021, uh, John Prine died of COVID or April 2020, 10.30 in the evening, it came out on the BBC. And then you realize that um, I think everyone that's in present today, you and, and Hamp and Amy and Danny, they all have their heroes in their lives that um, have formed and shaped us, that you know of people that are highly creative of all these different mediums that are incredibly positive energy. So right at that evening, uh, realizing my friend John Prine had died, I said, I'm going to write a, a small biography of 
those artists and roll those around those seeds so that when they take the roof off that structure, they hand the seeds out for planting again someday, they will, the artists will have been forgotten. We will all have been forgotten. But in those words, they then come back to life. And so for my daughter, Margaret, to do the 176 professional biographies, that was like 700 different resources using to find all that information. And you start reading these things about these people you admire deeply. And you say, oh my God, I never knew this about this woman or this man and what they had done for humanity. Cool. So yeah, so I think that was, um, that writing really clarified those ideas. And, and, I'm, and I'm very fortunate to have had it at that time. Well, it's a very eclectic sculpture and book. And um, yeah. it shows, yeah. It really does. And to have Matthew Welch, um, who is this really distinguished historian and curator, deputy director of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, give a framework of what a cura means. Not only that it was oh, yeah. designed, what not only that it was designed just for agrarian structures to store and preserve seeds, but was adopted very quickly as the identity of the Japanese people. The Ise Shrine is a, actually a kura that would have been a farmer's seed storage area. So religions quickly adapted the kura for sacred storage. So to see that perspective, because having grown up in an agrarian culture my whole life, my dad had the grain elevators and both sides are farming families. We look at the grain bin as just a simple tool that we drive by, it holds something. We don't know what it holds, but it's, the identity of how agrarian cultures have evolved in America. So in the 1950s, I remember my relatives absolutely celebrating after World War II, they had saved enough money to buy their first grain bin, to store their seeds and have control over their seeds for planting. Nice, very interesting idea. Amy, so, I think I already found out what you hope to accomplish when you embarked on your book. Um, but did your goals change as you talked to people? And I want to talk uh, talk about the role of mothers in your book as opposed to the role of fathers. I think I'll start there because my whole book um, started as an oral history project and it started with me asking women I knew if they would tell their story and with their child. Um, and that was originally gonna be an article on its own in an edited collection about mothering. So I kind of started off that way. Then I tried and, and it succeeded. I, I was able to get three, I think, fathers to talk to me. Um, what's really interesting about this is that I find that um, women in general are used to being more criticized and uh, are more oppressed uh, historically than men. And I think that this has kind of made mothers in particular who are always blamed for problems related to their children um, have been socialized to be, more, to be more vulnerable with each other and then have also been socialized in the latter half of the 20th century to question authority and um, not just take the word of the doctor and not just take the word of the treatment center. Um, and I think that what I saw, and particularly when I talked about um, the creation and, and the passing of Steve's law, which allowed um, public access to the opioid um, overdose drug that, that actually pulls a person back from death. Um, it's an agonist and it, um, that experience of walking around the the um, leg the Minnesota legislature and talking in the individual offices with other mothers to uh, mostly men uh, about what it was like. These women were going around; they had already lost their children 
their children had died and they were going to their representatives and they were going and saying, you have to pass this because I can't handle it if another child dies. No one should have to go through what I went through. So that sense of like community and collectiveness was really, that had a profound effect on, on how I thought about the book, that who are these people who are willing to tell these really intimate, really painful, often tragic stories <laughs> And why do they want to tell them? And so I think that um, when I think about accomplishing what I hope to accomplish, I, I think I hope to get the attention and um, of people who are so willing to just pass this off. They're so willing to drive by that person under a tent. They're so willing to, you know, just wave at the person who's asking for some money. They're so willing to not consider that, these are everyone is someone's child, right? And I think that that is what I'm, I'm hoping that um, I, by dissecting stigma, by, sh right, by revealing stigma and how it works example by example by example, I can kind of flatten its ability to um, have an impact on, and that we, so we can't look away. We can see that this is, these are our families. These are our children. Um, so I, that's, that's really like what I hope to accomplish. And mothers were just this really powerful entry point because that, that bill passed unanimously huh. in 2016. And you know, the one guy who voted against it when he saw on the board that it was unanimous, he quick changed his vote. So, I mean, it was much like maybe, maybe I can make a connection. I've been trying to find a place where I can make a connection to a football game, <laughs> but I, I, that was probably bad. But um probably not a very good one but it's it's that like the power of the stories uh that I watch these like law and order guys um just kind of go oh yeah that probably wouldn't hurt anybody you're right we should probably let you have that in your bedroom in case your child has you know overdoses um so that was just bringing it down from those I wanted to make it real to people and not make it about these lofty things that we can just not listen to did it Okay, that's our individual questions. And now we have one final round robin question. And maybe we should start with, should we start with Danny this time? Danny, did you find anything in the course of your research and writing, um, anything that surprised you, maybe even blew you away? And if you would did, would you share that with us and the readers? Sure. I, I think what surprised me most was the, um, the, the, the popularity of the, of the U of M's football program at the time. And, and, you know, even in talking to those that um, there are some that are, you know, that, that, that very vividly remember it. Um, Bruce Smith's uh, younger sister still lives in the twin cities. And she was, uh, you know, uh, she was in uh, elementary uh, junior high when, when uh, all this was happening. Um, but, um, but it just was very, very surprising to me just the um, just the the pride that that Minnesota had in this team and this program and how nationally known they were and what really surprised me too was how connected they were to this time period because um, you know I, I opened the book with uh, with the account of December 9th two days after the attack on Pearl Harbor and it's Bruce Smith of Faribault Minnesota who is on the radio accepting the Heisman Trophy at 9:45 and President Roosevelt comes on with a fireside chat um, just 15 minutes later and and I was very just it was very surprising to me just how um, how much they were in the national spotlight and and it was almost this juxtaposition of everyday life is continuing and people are watching these football games or, or reading about them in the newspaper and and this this war is brewing and it all comes to a head on December 7th and and the Minnesota Gophers you know are, are right there in it and so I think I I was surprised by that and, and just surprised by the amount of um, coverage they received nationally. They, um, in many ways, were just um, so well known from coast to coast. People knew that the, the Gophers of Minnesota were, you know, were, were one of the better teams in the country and um, kind of gave them an identity there. So, um, so that was very interesting to me and, and kind of fun to relive. Cool. Okay, um, Amy, anything that surprised you? I had the great fortune of getting to go to Europe in 2017, uh, tag along with a on a business trip with my husband. And I got to go to Zurich and meet and, and visit 
an addiction treatment facility in Zurich. And they had a terrible scourge of heroin and death in the 90s. And they created a model, the four pillar model, and did not have the baggage of the Minnesota model of our ideas about the moralism about drug use. Um, and they don't have that identity-based culture that's so individualistic the way we are. Um, and I was just blown away, not only listening to this doctor talk about how addiction itself isn't a chronic disease, it's made chronic by the way that we treat the people who use the drugs, <laughs> by the way we cast them out, by the way we don't take care of their needs, by the way. So he said, it's only chronic because we made it that way, that it was chosen. It doesn't have to be that way. And that, when he said that, I just, <laughs> like my hair was on fire, like, oh my God, I have to get home and talk about this. Um, and then also I took some photographs of the clinic and they just, and I have visited many methadone clinics and I have visited many, many treatment centers and they are for the most part dingy, depressing, broken. <laughs> They're not, there's nothing respectful and nothing, there's no feeling of care in them. There's no artwork. There's no, unless you pay an exorbitant amount of money to go to Hazleton and then you get the nice gardens. But I was just, I, it was full of color. There were big plants and there were kind people and there were nice chairs. And I just thought, you know, why can't we do this? And that, those, those two things, the, the rooms and then the, the concept of making something chronic um, have really stuck with me, especially as a, as a historian of medicine. It's just been like, wow, we could do something different if we just open our eyes a little bit. Hasn't Portugal done something like that? As a they, yes, they decriminalized. Um, they de decriminalized drugs. Yes, and right. and there are there's some really interesting stuff. And one thing I learned about this though is it gets like hot news. You know, it gets like it's a, a flash in the press. But what we haven't done is look at what could we do that would really make an impact based on what we know about our culture and our society. And that's, um, that's something that I hope the, it's not a black and white issue. It's not, oh, decriminalize drugs, uh, do this, do this, do this. It's, it's gonna be require this kind of integrated and really thoughtful approach that where we suspend judgment and uh, that could take a while. <laughs> but I hope that my book has done something towards um, making people think about that. Well, I'm going to give it to my husband. My husband is a family practitioner in Chisago County. So I, I'm going to give it to him to, to read. Okay, Richard, anything that surprised you? The big surprise was it actually worked. That we could actually suspend, <laughs> we could actually suspend um, a, a 2,000 pound stainless steel uh, grain bin in midair and uh, fill it with uh, generational materials that can, at some point in time, it's a 300 year roof, so it can last for 300 years. And so that would be quite a, um, a feat if, it, if we can um, stay that long 300 years without having some sort of upheaval. Yeah. So that, I think that was a, the, that there were so many people that believed in the project um, and the idea that um, that was also very, very encouraging. The information that you find out about the artists that are inside the core when you read every one of them, one of them I will just point out since your husband's in the medical field is um, the uh, great heart surgeon, Dr. John Teske. And his, teacher at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. He was born in Winnipeg. His teacher was standing right next to the Professor Lillehyde at the University of Minnesota on the first open heart surgery. That was the team. And I learned so much in the research that M Margaret did on 
Dr. Lillehyde and the impact the University of Minnesota had to the world on open heart surgery. Unbelievable. And um, so at one point in time, the only three places in all of North America doing open heart surgery, this really creative artistic process of care of humanity was University of Manitoba, University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic. That was the only three. So the other aspect is that was uh, in reading about Dr. John Teske when he was in high school, he lived one street down from Neil Young. <laughs> And Neil Young used to drive, he had a band called the Squires in Winnipeg and Neil Young drove around with all the equipment in a hearse around Winnipeg. <laughs> and so John Teske would have Neil Young over in his living room with his band practicing. And John Teske pulled out a harmonica and started playing along with the band. And Neil Young turned to him and said, show me how to do that. <laughs> so John Teske taught Neil Young how to play harmonica. Okay, that's a great story. <laughs> Hampton, what surprised you? You must, there must be a million things. Oh, well, there were a lot of things. Uh, I think though, the, the one thing I was probably just ignorant of and uh, found surprising was that during World War I, uh, Fort Snelling was turned into a gigantic hospital for returning wounded soldiers. It was General Hospital number 29. And it was part of this uh, massive system that the US government set up to treat wounded soldiers to uh, first in the field hospitals in Europe and then send them back at hospital sh ships back to the United States and then special trains to these general hospitals around the country that were located regionally so that soldiers could be near their families while they were recuperating and recovering. And there was quite an outfit at, at this fourth. I mean, they did orthopedic surgery, they did um, rehab, they, you know, taught them how to, to, they even did like artwork, painting and things to, for as part of their rehab. So it was quite a thing. And uh, but there was one story connected with that I found in the Minneapolis Journal, and Danny, you'll appreciate this one. It's, it was, they, um, they would send the, get the soldiers tickets to the football games and they would take them out to the, to the football games. And it was the, uh, describing the, um, it was the Wisconsin, Minnesota game. So it was a big game and the, it's, and the, the soldiers were late getting to the game. It's the middle of the first quarter. And these guys, the, the, the writer describes how these guys come hobbling into the stadium and everything stopped. Everybody stopped, the game stopped, the fans turned all their attention to these guys walking in. And it's just a really amazing story that they all stood up and applauded these wounded soldiers as they came in. It's quite, I was just totally blown away by this story. I'll have, if you're interested, I can, I can look up the citation for you, but it was just an amazing thing. Um, so that was, that was one of actually a lot of stories. Uh, there was the other kind of thing I thought was, it was an induction center during World War II and all these draftees would come in. And it, in the, one of the, uh, is an oral history of, 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 of uh, queer history of Minnesota that where one of the histories is this guy was one of many homosexual men who were working in the induction center. All these, all these guys that were doing the induction work in the army, somehow the army decided, well, these guys are a little, you know, so we'll just put them in offices. You know? So they, they, these guys would go, you know, these, there's this guy described, they'd be all these beautiful young men lined up outside waiting to go and it'd be, you know, sent off to Europe. It was terrible. Uh, but they also called it the seduction center was their, their nickname for it. <laughs> So that was a sort of a different story of, of life at Port Snelling. And that's a good place to end it. Um, thanks to our tremendous Emily Bookwald Award, Minnesota nonfiction finalists, and to all of you watching for taking part in this Meet the Finalist panel. If you enjoyed this talk, you can find a treasure trove of past events archived 
on the YouTube channel of the Minnesota Book Awards Steward Organization, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. You can find out more about future programs on their website, thefriends.org. In particular, mark your calendars for Tuesday, April 26th. That's the evening that the winner in this category and eight others are finally revealed. For the first time in two years, the Minnesota Book Award will be both live and in person. Please join us in St. Paul at the Ordway Center for the Performing Arts. Tickets are just $22 inclusive of processing fees. Visit thefriends.org slash MNBA for details. That's it for this panel. Thank you writers and we'll see you at the Ordway.